Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, Toolbox. This is week seven now of the story of Scripture, understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, hopefully, you know, as I was going back through the notes and just um, and, and kind of reviewing on my own, we, we've learned a lot during these past six weeks, and we've got a whole lot left to go, um, and we'll continue on this evening. But um, a, a couple of objectives, again, you can follow along with your notes that you can pull up on the website. If you have not... Um, if you if you've missed one of the sessions, you can go back to our website and you can pick up any of those. They are archived on there under past messages, and I believe the notes are on there as well. And you can catch up on that. And I would encourage you to because all of these again, it's progressive and they build upon one another. Um, and and we learn as we go. And we do a lot of review as well. So I'm going to come back and do some review. But tonight, as as we get into this, I'm going to state our objectives first. Then we'll review. Then we'll then we'll get into tonight's material. Um, one is, 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 as I've said every week, we've got a couple of objectives. The first one tonight is to, to understand covenant worship. So again, we've got a people that they're now in the land. Um, they've got a law in this land and, and, and we're going to see tonight how this, this poetry literature, how this wisdom literature, um, helps the people relate to God and interact with God and have a relationship with them. So we want to understand tonight covenant worship. And then the second thing is, is to recognize the purpose of wisdom literature. So there are some books and that we're going to talk about that, um, that give us great wisdom, and I think we can get a greater understanding. So we will come back to that. So I'll leave those there. We'll come back as we do our review. Again, as, as you guys are well aware, we've got um, the 512, 5512, 512, 5512, 512, 5512. There's the Old Testament broken down. We've got the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and that's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then currently we are in the history section, and we're going to take a break from that tonight, and we're going to move into the poetry section. But there are 12 books in, in history, and I would encourage you, I'm not going to go through all these, but I would encourage you to memorize them. You're going to understand how the Bible flows together. You're going to find your way around things more easily if you do that. And again, hopefully this class leads you to understand why our Bible is put together the way that it is. But you've got the, the 12 history books. Um, then you've got the, the poetry books, five of the poetry books, and we're going to talk about those five tonight. That's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We're going to see how each of those relates. Primarily, we're going to be speaking about Psalms and Proverbs, but we'll mention the other three as well. Then we take the major prophets um, and the 12 minor prophets. So 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. We've talked about if we took our arms around those last three sections and came back, we would drop them in where they fit in chronologically within the first two, within the Pentateuch, um, or the Torah, and the history book. So um, that's what we'll be doing this evening. But then we move on to the New Testament, which we will be getting to in a few weeks here. And uh, we've got 4 We've got the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've got the one book of history, which is Acts, tells how the church started. We've got the 21 letters or epistles primarily written by the apostles that, that teach us what we are to believe and how we are to live that out in, in our daily life. And then we've got the one book of prophecy, Revelation, that, that kind of comes full circle and brings us back to Genesis and how things wrap up and, and we win and Christ returns and, and, and everything is the way that it should be. So, um, so again, 512, 512, 41211. I'm going to say it over and over again every week so that you get that ingrained Never get lost with that, and then you know the structure of the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So um, encourage you to, to just do that. But we, we want to even do a little bit more review. Again, just a quick one, um, because I think, again, as you reflect, and, if, and I want to say this over and over again, because it makes sense to me more and more the more that I say it, and hopefully it will for you as well. But uh, a condensed version of what we've gone through for these last six weeks. We, we had Genesis 1 and 2, where we have the creation account, and we see that God is the creator God, and that he's good, and that what he creates is good, and, and, um, and mankind is the pinnacle of his creation. And we have described in chapters 1 and 2, really, um, what we talked about is shalom, where everything is, is right, we're under God's protection, we're in right relationship with him, and, and, and everything is good and perfect and at peace. It's, it's shalom. But then we know that sin entered into the picture in Genesis chapter 3 and things quickly fell from there. And we realized that, that, that we have a problem as mankind that we can do nothing about. And that problem is sin. Um, and we have no solution for that on our own. We are, we are slaves to sin. And, and we saw how that sin spread. And wherever there is sin, God said, there is death. 
Um, and so our only hope is that, that we have a covenant God, that we have the creator God who comes in and he has a solution. He is the only one, this, this source, this power, this being, this, this personal God outside of his creation that can, that can actually take charge and do something about the problem of sin. And we know that, that we have hints of that all through the creation account and all through Genesis, but, but he really starts to intervene when he, when he takes a man named Abraham um, and says, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a, a, a people and give you a land and you're going to, your descendants and through you, there's going to be a worldwide blessing. And we, we saw that in Genesis chapter 12. And that's really been a basis for a lot of what we've talked about, that God raises up this man and, and gives him this promise. And we call it the, the Abrahamic covenant. And that was an unconditional promise that God is going to be true on his word. He never goes back on his word. He can't do it. He always is faithful and and, and fulfills what he says. And again, he made a promise to this man that through you, Abraham, I'm going to raise up a people and I'm going to give them a land and they're going to be a, a worldwide blessing. And so then we followed the line of Abraham and we, we followed his family line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the way down through Joseph. And we tracked them all the way until the, the end of Genesis when they were in the land of, of Egypt. And then we know the story where they were in captivity and, and they really, they grew in numbers and they were basically a slave nation. So God was forming a people, but they had no land, they had no law, um, but he was fulfilling his promises. And he raised up a man named Moses, um, a, an amazing story with Moses where, where he'd been actually raised in the, in the household of Pharaoh. And God had used that to prepare Moses for the time when he would lead his people out of Egypt and, and into the land of promise. And, and we read about in the book of Exodus that story, that coming out, and, and we saw that um, that, that again, God was working and doing what only God could do, and, and, he, and he gave us another covenant called the Mosaic Covenant. And it was really the law for the land. And, and that was a conditional covenant. If the people would obey the law, if they would follow God, then they would be blessed in the land. If they chose to rebel against God, to not follow the law, then there would be curses. And we read about those in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And obviously there were more things we talked about in, in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy that that we could get into, but if so we're following the, 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 the timeline here, and there was a tension, really, in these two covenants. You have this unconditional promise from God to his people that he's going to raise them up and give them a land and, and a worldwide blessing, but at the same time, this Mosaic covenant to where, where there's a tension because the people have a part to play in it, and, and we see kind of the story, how it ebbs and flows, and, and they, they obey and things go well, they don't obey, and, and, and there's consequences, and we read about those, and again, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we see this tension. How is God going to be true to his word, but yet still honoring this, this conditional covenant that he had made with Moses and the people? So um, then the people move into the land, and we had the time of, of the judges and, and, um, and the conquest of the land, and, and we, we followed that. And, and then finally last week, we got into the times of the kings, and uh, we talked a little bit about King Saul and King David, and then God made a a new covenant, um, a covenant with King David um, and, and that he would raise up a seed and have a kingdom and, um, and that would follow in the line of David and, he, and again, that, that he would be a king that would, that would rule forever. And we touched on that last week and we're going to come back again to that next week. But, but now that, that's kind of where we're at. We basically ended in the middle of 2 Samuel chapter 7 where God had, had made that covenant with David. Um, but we're going to take a break now, and we're going to go to that, that poetry section of the scriptures. So we've gone through five, the, 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 the Pentateuch, the Torah. Then we're in the middle of the history section, the middle in the, the, of those 12 books. And we're going to pause for this one week and move to the next section, which is the, the poetry books. And we're going to talk about Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job and Song of Solomon for for a little while. So again, if we could wrap our arms around, uh, around this section, we would drop it in. And most of this is happening now where we've paused um, in the times of the kings. A lot of what we're going to talk about tonight was written by King David and then his son, King Solomon. So we're going to move um, on and we're, and we're going to talk again tonight um, and start off with the book of, of, of really um, Psalms. And tonight we want to talk a little bit about covenant worship and, and what that means. And and, you know, for a while now, um, I actually bought some books that this is actually the Bible. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but um, on the one side, it's got scripture. And then on the other side, it's just open for um, journaling and for writing down your thoughts. And, and I actually bought the whole New Testament, and I've been working through that. 
Um, but I also, this is the book of Psalms. So all 150 Psalms are, are in this. And, and I can tell you that as I've worked through Psalms, I read one Psalm or not even sometimes a full Psalm, but just whatever's on that page. And, and then for several months now, I've been journaling and I've been praying through that. Because if you're like me, um, and, and maybe you've got this conquered and you've got no problem, but prayer is a struggle for me. Um, it, it, there's a tension there. I, I know that I should pray. Um, and, and I know that it, that it works. I believe in it, and God tells us to pray, and, and that, that, the, that prayer is, is powerful and effective, but yet I struggle with it. Sometimes I don't even know what to pray, and, and then I feel like I'm praying the same things over and over again. Um, sometimes I, I pray off of lists. I've got lists of prayers for my wife, for my kids, for, for my friends, for the church, for prayer requests that people send in, and I, and I pray through those, but... Um, I don't know, sometimes it just doesn't seem to be, I'm, I'm wondering if that's really the essence of prayer. So f again, for a few months now, I've been in Psalms, and I've just basically used this as, as sure I pray about some of those other things, but, but I've used those and, and made those my prayers, because really, the book of Psalms, um, many of them were written by King David, there were other people that wrote them as well, but it's this compilation and this collection that led the people of Israel through worship, through covenant worship. How would they relate to this God, which, which we know is holy and set apart, as we've seen in the book of Leviticus? And how would they relate and, and speak with him and talk to him? Because it's amazing. We have a God who, who actually wants to commune with his people. And so um, the book of Psalms was, was actually a hymn book. It was actually the prayer book of the nation of Israel. And so I've been using it again, and I, I'll take the author's words, and, and I'll rewrite them in my own. And and, um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's deepened my relationship with God. I think Josh mentioned in a sermon on Sunday um, where he's been doing many of the same things. So I'd encourage you, we're going to see how can we relate and how we can worship our God through the book of Psalms. So again, if you can follow on your notes on page two, um, Psalms are divided. There's 150 Psalms, and they're actually divided into to five different books. And, I, and I've done another toolbox a couple of years ago I did um, a two-week toolbox just completely on the Psalms, and maybe I'll bring that back up at one point, but um, different people have different ideas on why they're broken up the way that they are, and I'm not going to get much into that, but if you look on your notes, um, there's book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five, and um, the first three, and, and again, not all of these are within them, but the first three books are primarily books that, that comprise Psalms of lament, and that's not a word that we use very often, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but um, but, but a lot of complaining, a lot of crying out to God in those, those first three books. And then the last two books of Psalms, from 90 up through 150, are, are more of praise and, and kind of worship and, and praising God. And we'll speak about that as well. But the first thing I want to do is, is to, again, is to address what a, a psalm of lament is. So I wrote down a definition there that I took from the guy that, that I'm actually getting a lot of this class from. Um, and the definition for a, a psalm of lament is, is really a song. And, and is, again, in the book of Psalms, most of these were put to music during the time that they were written as, as Israel worship. So these were actually songs. You know, they would sing out their prayers to God, which is what we should do in, in worship as well when we sing together. But it's a song expressing anguish to God for trouble caused by God. Or we could put in parentheses, allowed by God. External forces or personal weaknesses. So a song expressing anguish to God for trouble caused by God. External forces, in other words, I have enemies and I feel alone. Or from personal weaknesses, things we've caused. So the Psalms cry out to God. Um, they express anguish. They complain. They're, they're honest and they're raw. And the one thing that I've learned, I, I read two books in the last month on prayer as I've been going through Psalms. And one was by a guy named Philip Yancey, and another one was by Tim Keller, and both of them are just called prayer. And, and I learned a lot, but really what, what I've learned and what's helped me in this is, is there's, the, the prayer is, is really being honest with God, and we can cry out to him. He knows how we're feeling, so um, we can kind of let our emotion out. We can, we can rage. We can, we can express doubt. We can express fear. We can express anger, disappointment, and God invites that. He's actually bigger than our troubles, and he's got big shoulders, and, and we can be honest with him. And, and, and we live in a tough world. And I even want to put in that perspective, you know, is in the time of kings where we've kind of paused, we're, we're actually in a good inning um, for the nation of Israel. King David is on the throne. They are prosperous. They've been brought into the land. They're, they're pretty much at peace, and, and God makes a covenant with them. But, 
But even in the midst of that, and even with the promises of Deuteronomy chapter 28, where if the people actually follow the law, if they're actually in, you know, doing their part of the covenant with God, God will bless them. But even in the midst of that blessing, and we see it in our own lives as well, there's still the problem that goes back to Genesis chapter 3, and the problem of sin. And sometimes good things, I mean, bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people, and, and this world has heartache and disappointment, even in the midst of God's blessing. There's a reality to that. And I love the Psalms because it addresses that and it speaks to it and, 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 it, and, it, and it deals with the situation of the world that we're in where God still works and God's blessing and he's fulfilling his covenants and his commitments and he never goes back on his word. But yet life is hard. There's sickness, there, there are enemies, there's there are evil that, that takes place. There's, there, things don't turn out the way that we wish that they would. And God still blesses us in the midst of that, but there is a reality to that. And the Psalms give us a, a place to vent. We can go to God and say, take care of my enemies. You have vengeance. You, 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 I want justice, and, and I need you to carry out that for me. So it, it takes away the judgment from our own hands and gives it to God as we complain and as we lament to him. So as, as we move on, the, these laments in, in the Psalms oftentimes, there's a basic structure to them. And there's a lament. So there's, there's crying out to God, there's, there's, there's voicing your complaint, there's voicing your disappointment, your, your emotions. And then we give the reason for the lament. So that, that's kind of the basic structure of that, that, that God, I'm angry, I'm confused, I'm hurt because you have done this to me, or it's, you've allowed this to happen to me, or, or this is what someone has, has said about me, or, or God, I have sinned and I have caused this, and and so that's the basic structure. Then there's a little bit more of a complex structure. And again, we're not going to get into these very, very deeply, but, but we're, we address and we bring to God our petitions. God, you know, I, I, get me over this disease. God, get me through this pain and heartache. God, get me through this time and season. And, and we lament and we wail and we cry out just as we gave in the definition. We cry out to God. But then we, we, we see oftentimes in these psalms, there's a, a confession of trust. While God, I don't understand what's going on. While I don't like what's going on, I'm going to trust you and in your goodness. And I remember the promises that you've made. And I know you sit on the throne and I know you watch out for me and I know you care for me. A confession of trust. Again, and then we lay out what we want. We lay out what we want after we've told God who he is and given an introduction and, and we cry out and we confess trust. But then we say, this is what we want. And then a lot of times it circles back around. Not all the time. Sometimes the, the psalms end and they're, they're just kind of heavy and dark. Um, but oftentimes we come back and say, God, I'm going to praise you. You are worthy. You have created all things. You are good. You are the covenant maker. You are the covenant keeper. These kind of things. So honest, real, raw. I'd encourage you to get into, get into the psalms. This was how the people of God worshipped God, how they were taught to worship God. So we can use them in our own worship. And I think you'll be surprised too as you read through the psalms. You're oftentimes then going to be at church, and as we're singing songs together, you're going to say, I know where the guy got that from. came directly from a psalm that I just read last night. So there are themes within the psalms, themes of lament within the psalms of lament. And, and again, we mention it kind of in the definition, but there's complaint against God, where the problem that the person is complaining about really is God. God, why have you allowed this? Why have you, why have you chastised me this way? Why are you allowing these things to happen? Then there's a complaint against an enemy. God... It, where the problem is external, it, it, it might be sickness, it might be disease, it might be other people, it might be, you know, situations that have been brought onto us, natural disasters, COVID, you know, COVID-19, all these different things. Then there's a complaint against myself sometimes where we lament, why have I done this? I, God, I have not fulfilled, you know, my, my promises to you. I've gone wayward. My sin has caused this problem. So those are themes, complaint against God, complaint against an enemy, complaint against myself. And there's a couple psalms that contain all of these, Psalm 22, Psalm 38. But then also within the psalms, there's a resolve to cry out for God for help. God, I've got nowhere else to go. Things are coming down on me. I am feeling oppressed. I am feeling, I'm feeling depressed. I am feeling sad. I'm feeling anger. And you're the only place I can turn. You are the rock, and, and, I, and I cry out to you for help. Remember, we have a problem, and only God can fix it, and we are to be totally dependent upon him. And the psalms lead us in that direction, especially these psalms of lament. And then oftentimes also we need to come back, and we need to trust God for deliverance. 
And sometimes that deliverance will be in the situation right now. Often when I pray and when I pray for other people, I pray for quick deliverance. And I pray for God to intervene immediately. I pray for healing in those situations. But also I know oftentimes God says, hey, my pace is a little bit slower than yours. I know what I'm doing. Or sometimes the answer is even no. And I pray for people and I pray for myself that, God, this is what we want. This is what we ask you to do. But yet we know that you are God. And, and we're going to trust you no matter the outcome, whether you heal us, whether you take care of the situation now, later, or maybe even after we have gone on into the eternal kingdom. So those are, those are kind of some of the themes that we see in these, these psalms of lament. So I want to just read Psalm 142. And a lot of times, again, these psalms, remember, they're songs. They were sung out. They were put to music. So maybe if you want to, if you're watching, you don't even have to read along with me. Maybe you just close your eyes and listen. But this would be a song, a psalm of lament from, from King David. Psalm 142, and I will read it. It says it's a mascal of David. And again, sometimes there's introductions before I get into this to the psalms that tell us the, the, where they're taking place, what the situation was. Um, they use some of these different words that are instructive to the music directors and things that might seem a little strange to us. So just letting you know that. But I'm going to get back and I'm just going to read through the psalm as you listen and, and go along with it. Psalm 142. A mascal of David when he was in the cave. A prayer. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am de in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. And so again, we just see pouring the heart out. And, and there are some disturbing psalms. And again, what I love about them and what they teach us is how we are to relate with God. We, we are to have a, an honest relationship and an open relationship with him where we can, we can vent our grievances, where we can come and complain and, and be real because he knows it anyway. And that's the proper place where we lay it to him and say, God, I, I, I don't know what to do here. This is in your hands. You are my rescuer. I have a problem, and you are my only refuge and hope. Guide me and direct me and, and intervene and heal this. So a psalm of lament, of complaint, of pouring our heart out to God, filled with emotion. Right? So, so again, and, and we read about that in, in, in you know, Psalm 142, and you can see how the movement of that, and I don't need to go through that. But psalms of lament, and I would encourage you to, to not feel guilty, sometimes, again, when I pray, I almost want to pray in, in, in thinking that I want to look good for God. And yet, God honors the prayers of people who are honest, and, 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 and he's big, and he can take upon his shoulders whatever we bring to him. So take encouragement from that. That's how we're to relate to him, with honesty, with emotion, with depth, with feeling, with, with whatever is going on in our heart. And that's the proper place to bring it out. And that's a part of how we worship God and, and how we relate to him and how we enjoy him. So then psalms of praise would be a next category. And again, here's the definition that I'll use. I think it's on page four of your notes, but it's a song. Remember, these are songs put to music, a song rendering to God boastful, excited delight because of his faithful character, powerful works, and acts. So in, in other words, now we come and there are some psalms of basically complaint, of lament, but then there are also some great songs where we're just bold about how good God is, who he is, and what he's done. And there, we see some themes throughout these psalms of praise. And one would be creation. Um, oftentimes creation is mentioned, and remember, this fits in with the storyline that we've seen, how God created all things good, and there's one God, as, as Moses wrote to a people that were coming out of Egypt, where there had been you know, multiple gods worshipped, all these false gods. And, and so it goes back to creation to show that he is the one God who sits on the throne. And what he created was good. So we see creation. And there's some several psalms that I listed there. But, but, you know, basically creation came about by the word of God. He declared it, and it was so. And he was strong, and, 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 and he, when he wills, he acts, and, and he reigns, and, 
and he has great understanding and wisdom. This world is put together, as we read through about creation, this world is put together intricately and detailed, and, and, and we can continue to explore how vast and amazing creation is and, and, and huge it is, but also as we get smaller and smaller, we see the microscopic world and, and how God has put these things together, and it should bring us to praise as we think about his creation and his power, his strength. And many of the psalms that I've listed there um, read through those, and, the, and they will show those. And, the, and it should help us again in our own life, in our own worship, as it did for the nation of Israel, how we are to relate to God. We pour our hearts out to him, we cry to him, but we also praise him. So we see the theme of creation in there. We see um, the universality of, of God's presence and reign. I've listed it there in Psalm 33, uh, verses 6 through 9. But God is sovereign. He is in charge. There is nothing that escapes his notice. Um, there, there is nothing that goes on that he does not allow. There, there is nothing that, that, that he is not in control of. He is, he is the one power. He is all present and, and all knowing and he reigns. So we see that. Then we also see in many of these psalms of praise, we see the story of Israel, how God has worked in, in the history of Israel. Remember, these were David and, and some other writers of that time that were, that were putting these, down, these words down on paper. But um, they would go back and they would remember how, how God has called Abraham and, and how he's made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how he led them out of out of bondage and captivity, and, and they look back upon the many wonders that God has done, the manna and the, the provision in the desert, and, and how he brought them again, the plagues that he put on to, to, to Egypt to let Pharaoh, let the people go. So we see God's work in the history of Israel that draws out praise. So there are a couple types of, of praise psalms, and, and one, there's the descriptive praise, and you could read that in Psalm 100, but it's basically praising God for who he is and for what he does. So God, you are the, the almighty creator that created all of this. You lead your people out. You have given us salvation. You have sent your son, Jesus. You know, you, are, you only give us good things. You answer prayer. You are the ones that created the stars, the heavens, you know, those kind of things. So descriptive praise. We just tell God who he is. And oftentimes the Psalms can be a great guide for that as I, as I search for words to, to say how great God is and to magnify his name. So we can use those again in our personal worship of God. So descriptive praise. Then there's declarative praise. So we get a little bit more specific. God, you are great because you have, you, have, you have rescued me from this situation. You have given me the job that I desired. You have, you have granted a, an amazing family. You've given me a spouse. All these things, specific prayers, specific things that he has answered, we can praise God for. And again, as the definition said, we can be bold about this. It's not anything that we've done, but it's God blessing us and giving us great things. So we want to describe who God is, who he's what he's done for us, and, and as we praise him. So again, I'm just going to read Psalm, another psalm, and this is Psalm 146. And if you want, just listen, because again, there's just a richness and a depth in these, these psalms. But this would be one of a psalm of praise. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. So again, a couple types of psalms that can help us in our worship. The, the song of, of, of just... Of, of complaining, of lament, where, where we live in a world, and even though God blesses us and we are his people and he is our father, sometimes things are hard. And we need to relay that and, and to get that out and to not stuff that down. But then there's the other psalms, psalms of praise, just for who God is and, and what he has done, what he's created and what he's done in our lives. And you know, as I've learned about this, and as Josh mentioned in a sermon on Sunday, that that we can actually find joy in our God as we learn to worship him more and more. And when you think about it, when you find joy in something, 
you tend to praise it, right? I was thinking about it. This, if you go to a good movie or a good restaurant or have a good meal or, or, or you, you buy a product that works and you find enjoyment in it, you tend to want to tell others about it and you, you want to praise it, and, uh, whether it's a good joke. But to fully enjoy something is to glorify it, to magnify it, to praise it. So as we grow in our relationship with God through the Psalms, is we're honest with him and, and realizing that he can take it and wants to hear from us. He actually wants to hear our complaints and our hurts and our worries. We can be honest with him, and then that melts and turns into praise. So the Psalms can be a great guidebook for that, as it was for the nation of Israel. And again, remember the people in, in, in this time, you know, they would write Psalms of praise and of laments in, in good times and in bad, and it would lead them in their worship of God. So we move now into the book of Proverbs. And we're on page six of the notes. And, and I'm just going to give you a definition of what a proverb is. So again, we're in these, these five poetry books. We've gone through Psalms and seen some differences quickly and how we can use that in, in our worship of God. But now this, some wisdom literature. How can we use this in our, in, our, in our walk with other people as we interact with other people? So we've seen the vertical aspect of our relationship. But then there's also great wisdom in this poetry section as to how we live life and interact with people around us. So a proverb, which is, is, is this book that has 31 chapters, but a proverb is the definition is a short, salty, concrete, fixed, paradigmatic, poetically crafted saying. And I know that that's a lot, and this guy, this guy gave me this definition, and, and I kind of like it, and I'll break it down. So typically the proverbs are just short little pithy statements, not very long. They're salty in the fact that they're just kind of down to earth. They're just good old wisdom, wisdom sayings. Um, they're concrete in the fact that they're, they're anchored in, in real life. Um, so they point to the paradigms in our life and, and, um, and, and how we can react and how we, we act um, in life. So it really points things in an, in an honest direction. And, and just, you know, again, these are practical. We can actually use these things. As a matter of fact, sometimes you read through these Proverbs and it's like, that's a no-brainer. And they are, but, it, but it's almost like, you know, I know that when I've listened to a good sermon, a good sermon isn't something that, that makes me wonder what the heck they were talking about. And, but it, it, a good sermon to me is where I, I kind of have an aha moment. It's like, oh, I kind of get that. That makes sense. That, how did I miss that before? And that's really what, what, a, what a proverb does. It's like, yeah, that makes sense, where we take life and, and, he, and, he, and he speaks into that. And then it's poetically crafted. In other words, a lot of times these were, were made to memorize. They're, they're good with words. They're structured oftentimes. So um, just again, we're in this poetry section. So uh, there's the definition. But these short little sayings um, that, that, that tend to go to life, that give us wisdom in a, in a kind of a crafty, poetic manner. So wisdom in the book of Proverbs, um, really what we're talking about now as we move to wisdom and how to live this life, it, it combines faith in God. So we acknowledge that God is who he says he is, that he will do what he's promised to do. Um, but also it, it integrates that in our understanding of how, how to do day-to-day -day life, how life works. How do we make good decisions in light of, of God being our God and, and our creator and our father? How do we put all this together so that we live this out daily in our lives. So if we read through the book of Proverbs, a lot of times, um, again, poetry, and it, it, will, it, will, it, it, it gives us some characters. And we see that there are at least four characters, and there's many more than that mentioned. But some of the ones, as you read through it, um, you'll see, and, and it really personifies these people. So they're not specific individuals, but personified you know, people. And the first one would be the simple. And if you read through the Proverbs, it will talk about simple people. And and the definition of the simple person in Proverbs is a person that's not very smart and really doesn't want to be. So it's a person that says, I'm going to go life my own way. I'm going to keep making these crummy decisions, and I don't really care. And that's the, the simple that the Proverbs talk about. Then there's the fool. And this is the person that's, that's actually dangerous. This is the person that's not very smart, but he thinks he is. He does foolish things, but he's proud and haughty and doesn't want anybody telling him what to do and, and continues down that path. He's a dangerous person. There's the mocker. And this is the person that's smart, at least from a human level. You know, things seem to be going well for them. They, they might have some intelligence at the human level, but he's got no faith in God. So we don't want to be the, the simple person. We don't want to be the fool. We don't want to be the mocker. But then the fourth person that we often, often found that we want to use this book for so that we become wise. 
And this is the, the person that is discerning. And he integrates faith in God with life. So he understands that, that my belief in God, my faith in God, God's goodness, the, the laws and the regulations and the relationship that he's given to me, how do I work that out in my daily life knowing that? How do I work that out in my relationship with other people and the decisions that I have to make every day? And I guess the question that I would ask you, if, have you seen these type people in your life? Have you seen the simple or the fool or the mocker or the wise? And I, I think we have. And I know that we would like to be around wise people and we'd like to follow in their footsteps. But we've seen many of the others. But I guess the next question, and maybe even more pertinent, as we take this and personalize it, is when have you played those roles? Because we've probably all done these at certain times and in different situations and different, different years of our lives. The simple, the fool, the mocker, the wise. So we read Proverbs. We read this wisdom literature to gain wisdom to make better decisions, to do life better, as Pastor Tom often says. So again, this would just be an example of, of Proverbs, um, and this is chapter 24, and this would give us a, a fifth kind of person. So we've seen the simple, the fool, the mocker, the wise. This would describe a sluggard. And again, just to give you a little taste of this, and, and there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. They're easily read. They're quickly. You could read one chapter a day and, and go through the book of Proverbs 12 times a year, and I'm telling you, your wisdom factor would would go sky high. But Ch Proverbs chapter 24 says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. So in other words, he's making an observation here. Goes past the field of, of basically a sluggard, a lazy man, and what's happened? Things have become dilapidated. He's not taking care of his vineyard. He's not taking care of the walls around it. He's let things slide and let him go into just crumbles. Verse 32, it says, I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. And this is the lesson he gives as he sees the way of the sluggard. This is wisdom from Solomon, who we'll talk about more next week. But it says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So again, remember, we're using poetic language here. So he's not saying that that it's wrong to rest. He's not saying that it's wrong to enjoy life, to take breathers, to get a good night's sleep. He's not saying, as Josh has addressed in, our, in the last few weeks on our Sunday sermons, that, it, that, it's, that it's good to always be busy and hurried and to be doing things constantly. But what he's saying is we want to we tend to the important things in life. We want to work hard. We want to take care of the things that have been entrusted to us. Because if we don't, if we're like the sluggard and we're lazy and we just don't, if we don't work and if we don't produce and we don't take care and be good stewards of what God has given to us, he says, then poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. And again, I think that's good wisdom. That's a good way to live. And, and if we would understand that, that, that we can control only ourselves and a lot of what happens to us in life is, is what we put into life. So we work hard, we prepare, we take care of the things that have been entrusted to us. We use our gifts and our talents and to take care of ourselves and to provide for ourselves. And, and that's wisdom. That's a good way to live. So there, the Proverbs just gives you great thoughts on, on how to deal with people, how to interact with people, to, to, to discern our ways so that we do not become foolish or a mocker or, or the simple, but so that we become wise in the eyes of God and how we can integrate our faith with our daily decisions and our daily relationships. So again, encourage you. Great, great tool that we have that God has given to us and, and that the, the Israelites use to, to interact with people, to worship God, and, and to learn how to do life. So we've seen the book of Psalms, we've seen the book of Proverbs, and then there's some non-proverbial wisdom in, in these other three books. So um, Job, the book of Job, it's, it's kind of a long book and it's, it's redundant and it's kind of tough to read sometimes, but um, Job, and I'm not going to get into the story of it much, but Job deals with the complexity of life. Oftentimes people think that the book of Job, that the main theme is that, is that you know, that, that, that we live in a world that's just, um, that, that's just tough and bad things happen to good people, and, and that's addressed. But, but um, Job deals with the complexity, really, of our life, that, and that, that God is sovereign. And sometimes he allows things to happen that, that we wish would not happen. 
And it really forces into a higher level of theology, of thinking of who God is. And, and really the, the book of Job, what it comes down to, where, where Job gets no answers and where we really we see what's happening behind the scenes. But we can't understand God's ways. And are we going to praise God when things are well and good, which we should? Are we equally going to praise him when things are not going so well, when we're complaining, when we're lamenting? Are we going to trust God? Because see, again, life is hard. And if we put in this in context of, of the covenant people, of the, of the Israelites, they, they knew the consequences of Deuteronomy chapter 28. If they obeyed, things went well. If they didn't obey, things went bad. But even that promise that things will go well when you obey me, as we've said, we still live in a world fallen with sin. So when things seem to not be working out the way that we thought, are we going to trust in our sovereign God who is worthy to be praised, who has come through over and over again and will come through, whether that's in this world or whether that's in the world to come? Will he calm the storm or sometimes he just calms the storm, calms us in the midst of the storm? So Job gives us some great deep theology and there are all kinds of, of things in, th that we can learn from that. Then there, there's the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes is, is a search for the meaning of life. I think Josh gave a, a message series on this a while back. But um, meaning that this book basically says is only found in God. And again, Josh talked about it some this, this Sunday. But the book of Ecclesiastes is really a book that can be a little depressing when you read it. Um, but it's a timeless book. And it, it really describes the quest um, of humanity striving to find meaning and purpose in life. And what a timely book. For our world that is filled with depression, that is filled with, with people that are over-medicated, and, and um, we, we just realized that in this book, the wisdom that we gain from this is that, that oftentimes we think that we will find meaning and satisfaction in the things that we attain. The writer in this, you know, who was King Solomon, rich and wealthy beyond measure, had all the things that you would want from an earthly standpoint. I mean, he had he had money. He had all the relationships that he wanted. He, had, he, 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 he kept himself from nothing, the book says. Any kind of desire that you can imagine, Solomon went after. And what he basically looked at as he wrote this, as he said at the end, it all is meaningless. And it comes down to, to serving God and to loving him and, um, and, and loving and fearing him and obeying his commandments. That's where we find meaning and purpose and pleasure in life, this relationship that we have with our creator God that loves us. So that would be a book that we would read to, to give us purpose and meaning. And then there's a book, Song of Songs, sometimes called Song of Solomon. And it was a practical book about wisdom and, and marriage and love and, and sexuality. And sometimes people read it as, as kind of a metaphor for the relationship that God has with his people. But I think that the people of the day realized that this was a book about about marriage love and it was sexual and sensual and and tells us what god delights in in the, in the marriage of a husband and a wife and and um and sometimes you're reading through that and you're thinking is is this describing what i think it's describing and it is and it's the delight that a man finds with a woman and a woman finds with her husband so uh, a a great book for 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 marriage and and again seeing that god delights in that and it's a gift that he's given to us so we see these you know, again, in Proverbs, Psalms, and, and, and Ecclesiastes, and Job, and, and Song of Songs, we see great wisdom for living, and we see great ways to worship. So again, just summarizing what we've seen in this poetry language, in this poetry section of Scripture that we could pick up and put within the history section from these great writers as they lead the people, the nation of Israel, in, in worship and in wisdom, in how to deal with God and how to deal with other people. Um, we see some great themes. So about God, if we were to summarize these five books, we see over and over again that God is the creator, that he is the one that is above all else, that, that he spoke and the world came into existence, that, that he is in charge and he's the good creator, creator God. And, and he is to be feared and worshiped. And that word doesn't mean that we cower down, you know, and, but, but he is a God who is holy and, and mighty and just and pure and and we need to keep that in perspective, who we are dealing with. But it is to be an awe and a reverence for this God. And he is to be worshipped as such. So we see this theme that he's the creator, that he is to be feared and worshipped. And then also that he is the covenant keeper. That he loves his people. He could, do, he could be done with us at any moment. And, and he's had plenty of reasons to do that. But he's never completely washed his hands 
of mankind. As a matter of fact, we're seeing in the covenants how he has a plan. And he loves us and he cares for us. And he will never go back on his word. And God is calling people to him. So we see those themes about God. And then we see these themes about man. That we are sinful beings. In other words, we are covenant betrayers. We get back to that problem that we've talked about so often in this series. And that is sin. We, we are, our, the human heart is evil and wicked. And it needs, we need new hearts. We need, to be, we need to be resurrected. We need to be born again. So we see the sin of man. And the fact that we are needy that we can't fix this problem on our own, that we are to rely upon God for everything. He is our refuge, our strength. He is the one that we run to, we hide under. He is our foundation. He is our rock. So we need God. We cannot do things on our own. Jesus reiterated that in, 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 in the New Testament, that on your own you can do nothing. So it shows that we are sinful, that we are needy. And then also that, that mankind is wise only if, if he or she worships and fears the Lord. That's where true wisdom comes. So if we want to live a life that, that is going down the right path, then we acknowledge who God is. We worship him. We learn from him. We acknowledge that we are sinful, needy creatures, and that God is the one that we look to and run to for direction and strength in this life. So those are the themes that we get. So, so hopefully you understand as we've just taken a little detour from our from our journey, uh, from our chronological journey, which we will get back to next week. Um, we're going to get back into the time of kings next week. We'll talk a little bit more about David and, and the messianic expectation that we learned a little bit about last week. Um, we're going to continue back in that chronological pattern. We're going to talk about King Solomon and how things were good with David and Solomon, but how they started to take a turn and head downwards. And, and this idea of these covenants that God has made, we'll continue on with that. So Hopefully, again, you're continuing to learn. Hopefully, tonight will enhance your worship and your wisdom as we relate to our amazing God the way that the Jews, the Israelites did with their God and learn from that, from the scriptures. Um, but again, this is just an amazing book, an amazing book that, that is put together with such wisdom and care for us. What a gift from God. So I hope you're learning as we grow in this together and so ultimately that we can relate to our Father in true relationship, not, not this religious thing, but true relationship and community and communion with God. So let's go to him in prayer. Father in heaven, just thank you for, uh, just for the array of, of words that you have given to us in the scriptures. And Father, I thank you that sometimes when I don't know what to pray, when I don't know what to say, you have given me uh, your words. In the Psalms, I, I can do that. And then you've given us wisdom and meaning in life as we read through the Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes and Job that answers some of these deepest questions that we have. And, and ultimately, God, it comes down to acknowledging that we need you. You are in control. You are our God. You are our King. You are our Savior. And, and, and you love us and care for us. And, and, and wisdom in this world is, is acknowledging who you are and following your Son, Jesus Christ. So help us to be filled with wisdom. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness as we learn about your mighty love for your people that you have called out in this world. And we are grateful for that and grateful for the opportunity that we have to know you through your words and to understand this amazing story better and better. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So hopefully you get caught up on this series. Enjoy it, learning more and more, and we'll be back next week. Thanks a lot.